some of you know that there was a time in my life where I was moving away from my marriage, literally leaving Debbie. Now, we hadn't left the house or anything like that, but I probably had checked out already. Um, it, it was bad for me. And during that time, there were some people who kind of saw stuff happening inside of Bill. And I had a friend who came to me and, and, and just sat down with me. And, and he cared enough about me to talk to me about what he saw. It's probably the thing that caused me to then start praying a prayer that is so important. And the prayer was, Jesus, break me. I didn't know what all that was going to mean. I knew that, that praying a prayer like that meant Jesus was going to do whatever I, he had, he wanted to do, that, and whatever he needed to do to break me. There were some others who probably saw a little bit of stuff going on in me too, but they never came to me like that. <clears throat> oh, there were some comments made, some kind of almost rude statements, but, no, but they never came and said, Bill, concerned about what we see in you. They were critical. This other brother was critical too, wasn't he? He was so critical. He loved me so much that he was willing to come to me. Not to just say, you fool or you idiot or I hate you or any of those other things, but it was, I love you, man. And I'm concerned about something I see. It, 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 do, is this accurate? Do I see this in you, Bill? And as I say, it was, it was Jim's love that touched my heart that day enough to break through. It reminds me of a man who was very critical, very critical of a man that he knew. He was so critical of him that he came and he was afraid of how he would talk to him and so he told him a story. And the story he told him was of this farmer or shepherd or man who had one little sheep. One little sheep. And there was this really wealthy man who had thousands of sheep. And he came and he took that one little sheep away from that man who just had one. And as he told this story to his friend, his friend became irate, livid, to the point of... He was ready to go out and destroy that rich man. And he asked Nathan, who is it? And Nathan said, King David, it's you. Earlier, when Leslie read from Psalm 32, she was reading some of David's feelings. When we don't admit our sin, it literally affects our bodies. Obviously affects our relationships. This morning we're going to look at a really tough, tough statement in Scripture. But I need to warn you. It is probably one of the most misused texts in Scripture. It's a text that we sometimes throw out at one another. It's a text clearly that the world throws out at, at us. <laughs> People Magazine some years ago was interviewing a well-known actor who was defending the moral indiscretions of former President Clinton. Why should we be upset over such a thing? We're all sinners, and it just shows that President Clinton is just like the rest of us. The Bible says, judge not, that ye be not judged. That's the text we're going to look at this morning. Matthew chapter 7. Do not be judged. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. 
For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? By the way, Jesus does have a sense of humor, okay? And it's okay to laugh sometimes at his humor, okay? Can you imagine somebody walking around with a plank, a big plank, because the, the, the plank was this big, a big beam. Imagine that beam there. Oh, that's too big, okay? So, so maybe you just got to imagine a two-by-four, because, you know, you wouldn't be able to hold anything more than that. But I want you to imagine a two-by-four sticking out of your eye, and you're going to go up to somebody, and you, excuse me, I need to help you with your speck in yours. I mean, can you imagine the, the goofiness that Jesus is describing here? Who's going to take a speck? Do you realize what you're going to do to that other person's eye when you try to look at them? Okay, just poke, just poke the person next to you in their eye, okay? No, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> okay, walking around with a beam in my eye. Oh, you need help? Let me see if I can help you. Can you imagine the doctor doing surgery that way? Okay, I'm going to look at it in here. I'm going to cut this person up and try to see what I can do in there because you know, I got this board. So I'm, it's just goofy, okay? So there is some humor that Jesus uses when he tells his stories. I apologize. I had to just tell you that. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's this plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And some of you are saying, why did you include that last comment? I mean, really, this is one of those texts where you, I, I should just do verses 1 through 5, right? I mean, that kind of all fit together, right? Don't judge, don't, don't attack, you know, watch out for the sawdust and the plank in your eye and you're a hypocrite and all that. I include verse 6 because it is part of what Jesus is preaching as he's preaching to the crowd. I also need to remind you that this is a crowd. We sometimes take this text and we make it only about the Pharisees, the religious people. And I'm sure that there were some in the crowd. But do you remember who he was speaking to when he was giving what we call the Sermon on the Mount? He's got some, what, several hundreds of people out there. And, and it's an incredible location because they can hear all the way down to the Sea of Galilee, all the way up on the, the hillside where he's standing. There must have been 5,000, maybe even more people that are listening. And they all could hear. And frankly... Leslie and Debbie and I were there some months back and we saw the spot and we were told about how you literally can, because of the way the whole environment is all set up, you can stand in this place and hear 300 yards down the hill exactly what's being said up in this location. It's, just, it's like a natural amphitheater. Anybody been to the Hollywood Bowl? Okay, think about that kind of a setting, only it's God created the amphitheater. Uh, it's put right out there in a natural environment, and everyone can hear. So he's speaking to the crowds, isn't he? Don't miss this. Don't let this be so much about the Pharisees that you don't hear what Jesus wants you to hear today. God, this is the first most important thing, God will judge. The word there for judge, do not judge, or you too will be judged, is the word crino. It means to judge, to criticize, to slander, to condemn. Whoa. Who of us has the authority, the right, to condemn someone else to hell? I mean, people say it, though, don't we? Well, hopefully not we, right? But have you ever heard it? Somebody say to somebody else, go to hell! And I apologize if somebody's offended for me saying that, but that's literally what people say, right? And in a sense, that's what they mean, and that's what Jesus is even talking about. Don't be condemning people. Don't be judging somebody to hell, because you don't have that authority. 
You don't have that right. That is a God responsibility. John 12 says, I have come into this world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. Interesting, Jesus is saying, I don't judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Well, at least this is in his first coming. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. There's that word condemn, isn't it? For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. The Father is the one who condemns. Whoa. Is that why Jesus cries out? Father, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because as Jesus hangs on the cross, the condemnation, the judgment of the world is placed upon him. The sin of the world becomes his and God the Father has to turn his back on him as he is judged and pays the penalty for sin. David Guzik says this is the Bible verse that seems to be most popular in our present day. But most of the people who quote this verse don't understand what Jesus said. They seem to think Jesus commanded a universal acceptance of any lifestyle or any teaching. If we see what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15 to 16, which I'll read in a moment, he commands us to know people by the fruit of their life and some sort of assessment is necessary for that. The Christian is called to unconditionally love. But the Christian is not called to unconditional approval. We really can love people who do things that should not be approved of. Instead, Jesus is speaking against being judgmental. That is, judging motives and the inner man, which only God can know. We can judge the fruit of a man, but we can rarely judge their motives with accuracy. Matthew 7, 12 to 16. Uh, we just read 1 through 6, right? So this is in the same conversation. It's the same sermon. It's moments later. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Isn't this interesting? The, the summary of the whole law. The summary of the teachings of the prophets. The summary of the, for then the Ten Commandments is what? What does Jesus say it is? Do to others. Uh-uh. Read the verse here. There's a summary of one section that says love God, all your heart, 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 mind, soul, and strength. There's a summary of another section, love your neighbor as yourself. But the summary of it all, what does Jesus say? Do to others. See it? What you would have them do to you, which includes God then, doesn't it? Now just think, ponder that for a moment. Enter, here, this is Jill Jesus. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In fact, if you continue on, just a little bit farther, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one, catch this next phrase, don't jump to the other text, this is Sermon on Mount text here, okay? Don't misquote. What's it say next? But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I don't know about you, but this is pretty tough language in, a, in, in, a, in, in almost the same breath where he's just said, judge not. Isn't it kind of hard language? Romans 10, 14, verse 10. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. Therefore, verse 13, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. You're judged based on what? Whether you've done God's will. Don't judge your brother. Don't condemn them. Don't send them somewhere. James 4, 10 to 12. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Same word again. Don't crino one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? It's not our responsibility to send somebody to hell or heaven. We don't judge, but we do invite, don't we? We do share. We do love, like my friend. He says, here's what Jesus warns us about. He says, judge not. And notice, he doesn't just say judge not, period. He says, judge not, lest you be judged. In fact, judge by the way. You will be judged by the way you judge. Jesus does not prohibit judgment of others. He only requires that our judgment be completely fair and that we only judge others by a standard we would also like to be judged by. Catch that? We assess, we evaluate, we look at others based on how we want to be looked at. Most of our judgment in regard to others is wrong. Not because we judge according to a standard, but because we are hypocritical in the application of that standard. We ignore the standard in our own life. We judge others by one, one standard and ourselves by another, being far more generous to ourselves. <laughs> but because we're, excuse me, <laughs> with the measure you use, Jesus said, it will be measured to you. <laughs> Some rabbis had this teaching. They said that, that, that God had two measures that he used to judge people. One was a maj measure of justice, and the other was a measure of mercy. Which one would you prefer? <laughs> I appreciate Ray Pritchard's uh, explanation of hypocritical judgment. He says, you judge them because they lose their temper, but I have a righteous anger. <laughs> Someone else, they're a jerk. I'm just having a bad day. <laughs> they have a critical spirit. I simply bluntly tell the truth. <laughs> they gossip. I have prayer requests. <laughs> <laughs> they curse and swear. I simply let off steam. They're pushy. I'm intensely goal oriented. <laughs> they're greedy. I'm simply taking care of business. They're a hypochondriac. I'm really sick. And they stink. I merely have an earthly aroma. <laughs> There's a lady who came into the, to the, to the doctor's office. She had been at the grocery store. She had bought some cheese. And she comes in the doctor's office. And everybody she meets in the doctor's office smells terribly. Until finally she opens up her purses. And she realizes it's her that smells because of the cheese that she brought with her. Now, notice what Jesus goes on to say. He's warned us about judging, right? But, 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 but be careful, and we're going to come back to this. Be careful. We still have a responsibility. But look what he says next. First, get rid of your sin. 
He says, look, before you can take care of the speck, the splinter, the little dust that's in your brother or your sister's eye, you've got this big plank sticking out of yours. Deal with that, he says first. Psalm 51, another psalm from David after Nathan had talked to him about his sin. He's praised to God, create in me a pure heart, O God, and, a, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, Lord. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, God, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And then, oh, get this one. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. It's Romans 2, verses 4 and 6. Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, his patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to what? Repentance. God's grace, his loving kindness, the, the hesed of the Old Testament, it's meant to lead you to repentance. Now that's interesting, isn't it? It's not just to make me feel good, is it? It's actually going to convict me, isn't it? And that's what happens to David. And it's going to convict me to the point that I want to change and that I may pray, Jesus, break me. And it will lead me to repentance. And repentance means I'm going to turn. I'm going to change the direction I'm going. I'm going to admit sin, confess it, and accept then forgiveness. He goes on. But because of your, watch out, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Isn't that what he said in Matthew 7? According to whether we've done the will of God. Here again, I have another pastor, and I apologize. I missed writing down who it was. But he said, we break this command when we think the worst of others. We break this command when we only speak to others about their faults. We break this command when we judge an entire life only by its worst moments. And for years, there have been people who have been carrying a D. How do you write it? Did I write it the right way for you? Carrying a D around on their chest. And the D is for divorced. And they've, and they've said, oh, see, I'm unforgivable because I committed this sin. And, and, and that may have been their worst moment. And, and the sin, the, the divorce may have happened simply because of them and, and more them than the other partner. And, and they can't even justify it on, on any of the biblical grounds because they were the ones who committed adultery. Who knows? And they're wearing this one there. And is that the unforgivable sin, friends? No, oh, but because of their worst moment, their worst sin, whatever it was, they wear this label. We break this command when we judge others without considering ourselves in the same circumstances. We break this command when we judge others without being mindful that we ourselves will be judged. And we break this command when we judge the hidden motives of others. Because obviously we know what they're thinking and feeling, correct? Thank you for some of you who shook your head no. But he says this. Take the plank out of your own eye. I need to hit us where it really matters. Those of you who are married, this is a series on marriage. <laughs> Those of you who are married have a plank in your eye. We have a plank in our eye. And the plank is, are we in our marriages modeling Jesus so other people can see Jesus through our marriage? Are we helping people see that this incredible thing, love and respect, is something that we're giving to each other. Are our marriages pure? Those of you who aren't married may have a plank in your eye. You're single. 
What do you do with your thoughts? What vulnerable things come into your thought life and, and even into, let's face it, your sex life? And do you feed that sex life in a way that you shouldn't? Because the Bible calls it fornication if you're having sex prior to marriage. Adultery if you're having sex with somebody who is married. Uh, and, and, and then Jesus, just, he, like, he, he just really made it hard for us all. Because he said, hey, if you thought it, you've committed it. Okay, like, so if I've watched, if I've looked at porn, and, and I imagine that person without clothing, uh, I've just been thinking something that I shouldn't have. A, if I thought it, I've committed it. Wow. So, folks, I don't know what your sin is. Maybe you don't have anything relational that, you're prob that you have as a problem. Maybe your marriage is perfect and, and everyone can see Jesus in you and, and you love and you forgive and you're not holding anything against your spouse and, and you've never argued, you've never cussed them out, you've never hollered at them, you've never been offensive, you're never mean-spirited, and you never think that they're bad. Okay? I mean, you, you always think they're wonderful and you always tell everybody else publicly, you're always communicating how special they are and, and you treat them to the best. I mean, maybe you have got all that and so you're wonderful. Praise Jesus. Okay. Those of you who are single and not married, you know, maybe you've kept yourself pure. You do, you've had the burn, but you know how to handle it. You know how Jesus provides a way out when you're tempted. You never give in to it, never have, never been tempted at all. In fact, don't, nothing about pornography makes any sense to you. And, you. and you've always been pure, and you're still waiting. Even though you might be 99, you're waiting for that person that you can, I don't know, maybe you've never had that. But folks, if you're not perfect, Jesus wants you to deal with your sin. Now, we have a responsibility to one another. I'm going to come to that in a moment. But he says, before you can help one another, you have got to deal with the plank in your own eye. And I guess I would ask you to pray a simple prayer. Jesus, break me. By the way, Bill can pray that for himself. I didn't ask you to pray that for me. <laughs> <laughs> Pray it for yourself. <laughs> but be careful if you're sincere when you pray it. But welcome Jesus if you're sincere when you pray it. Get rid of your sins. But also, friends, he says, then, then go help your brother, okay? Once you get rid of the plank, okay, now that's out of the eye. It's all cleared up, and okay? And now you can see again. You can see clearly. Now you may be able to see to find the speck in your friend's eye. Now you can help them with their sawdust, which they can't see, and it's scratching their eye, and it's causing them pain and discomfort and all. Now you're able to be available to them. But deal with your plank first. Jesus calls us to face our sins so that we can help others with theirs. Face your sin so you can help others with theirs. Once we've been forgiven, we're able to go into the world and preach the gospel to all people. We are even called to admonish one another so that we can become more like Jesus Christ. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin... You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you fulfill the law of Christ. How are you going to know if somebody's caught in a sin? Because uh, you caught them in it? Because you saw it? Okay, how many of you have done your devotions from Leviticus? <laughs> Thank you. There's actually some really, really good stuff in Leviticus. Listen to this one. Leviticus 19, verse 17. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly so you will not share in their guilt. Leviticus is about relationships. We sometimes forget that. And the things that we need to do to keep those relationships pure. What does judgment look like? Matthew 7, 6 said, watch out. 
He said, do not judge or you're going to be judged. With the measure you judge, you shall be judged. Clean the plank out of your own eye and then you can deal with your, your friend's your friend's splinter, and immediately sees, he goes on to tell us to judge. Doesn't he? Not to send to hell, but he tells us to make assessment, doesn't he? Because look at what he says next. It's practically in the same breath. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Don't give your pearls to pigs. Pearls are really expensive. They're really hard to come by. Don't feed them to a pig. They're not going to have any appreciation for it. Watch out for the dogs. These are the dogs. These are not the nice little puppy dogs that everyone loves, okay? These are the nasty dogs that run the streets. They bite people. They're dirty and they eat up the garbage and all. He says, don't give dogs what is sacred. And that's an interesting phrase. He says, don't give dogs the, the meat from the table of sacrifice. That's what's sacred. The meat that's been offered to God as a sacrifice. You don't take that meat out and then throw it to the dogs. Okay? They might throw their bones out in the street, okay? But the, the, but the meat offered to God was burned up on the sacrifice, burned up on the altar, or a portion of it was given to the priests. But you don't give it to the dogs out on the street. You've got to make decision. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. I go back to Ray Pritchard again. He gives us a practical checklist to assess whether one is prone to judging with a critical or condemnatory spirit. Okay, listen to this. Blowing small things out of proportion. Maximizing the sins of others, their faults, foibles, and their petty ways. Coming to quick, hasty, negative conclusions about other people. Making mountains out of molehills. Getting involved in situations where you should not be involved. Passing along critical stories to others. Having a strong bias to find others guilty. Being too harsh even when speaking the truth. Adding aggravating remarks when telling a story. Yeah, uh, couples watch out for that one. Dismissing an unkind remark by saying, I was only joking. <laughs> saying something critical and then trying to cover it up. Being unkind and then quickly changing the subject telling too many people about what others have done to us, taking pleasure in condemning others, telling the truth in order to hurt, not to help, putting others down in order to make yourself look better, minimizing your sins while magnifying the sins of others. For the, with the measure you judge, you will be judged. <clears throat> Clearly, not all judging is forbidden. Ray Pritchard explains what our Lord does not mean by the command, do not judge, writing that Jesus is not saying we should never pass any sort of judgment. Every day, we make hundreds of judgments about things around us, don't we? You just drive down the road. What kind of judgments are you making about the people driving next to you? Probably not about their hairstyle. It is not wrong, for instance, to sit on a jury and render a verdict, is it? Nor is it wrong for an admissions committee to decide which students to accept and which to reject unless they're using prejudice to do that. Nor is it wrong for an employer to decide who gets a promotion and who doesn't, again, unless they use unjust ways. Nor is it wrong for schools to judge certain students worthy of high honor at graduation. Nor is it wrong to convict a criminal of a crime. We all have to make decisions every day that involve other people, don't we? We pass judgment on appearance, behavior, speech, deportment, attitude, work ethic, productivity, keeping or breaking a promise, guilt or innocence, which person we believe and which person we do not believe. Whatever the words of Jesus mean, they can't mean that we never pass judgment in any sense at any time. It's just not true, folks. John Stott adds, the command to judge not is not a requirement to be blind, but rather a plea, oh, I love this, a plea to be generous. Jesus does not tell us to cease to be men by suspending our critical powers, which help to distinguish us from animals, but to renounce the presumptuous ambition to be God, setting ourselves up as judges. Judges. 
Matthew 7, 6 implies a discerning judgment must be made regarding, watch out here, a dog or a pig. Matthew 7, 15 and 20, Jesus says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. How do you know? You have to make a judgment. The, but inwardly, watch out, they are ravenous wolves. So then you will know them by their fruit. So you, you watch what people do and say. John 7, 24, Jesus even said, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That was John 7, 24. Jesus actually commands us to judge, but to do so fairly and with a basis of truth and not simply on outward appearance. Matthew 18, the great pa tough passage, which talks about discipline. And he says, verse 15, and if your brother sins, go and what? Reprove him in private. And if he listens to you, you have won your brother. So to not, to judge not lest you be judged has nothing to do with an ignoring sin, does it? But in point of fact, it will actually recognize sin. But in love, go to that brother or sister, in case you girls are feeling left out. 2 Corinthians 5, writing to the Corinthians, Paul addresses the, the, the issue of the church's lack of action and failure to mourn over dealing with the grievous immorality in their body. They are celebrating the fact that they are gracious. See, careful. They're celebrating the fact that they are gracious because they have, a, they have a brother in their midst who's living with, means he's having sex with, his father's wife. Okay, it's not quite as sick as you think. She's her, her, his stepmother. Okay, still weird. And they're saying, it's okay. Look, look, in fact, we are able to embrace and welcome and encourage and accept this man even though he's living with his father's wife. And Paul says, hold on. For I on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him. This does not mean that Paul has sent him to hell. But he's evaluated this man's action. He's already said, it's wrong. I've judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one. Oh, this gets serious. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He goes on in verses 12 to 13, for what, I, for what have I to do with judging outsiders, unbelievers? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But certainly it is your job to judge those inside the church who are sinning in these ways. But those who are outside, God judges. Folks, sin, <coughs> sin must be judged. I hope that in this church you experience grace. I hope that because you experience grace, it leads you to repentance and therefore forgiveness. I hope that you don't get a mean-spirited attitude from your pastor, from his sermons, from what we do as a ministry. But friends, we must do our ministry based on the scripture. This summer, the Supreme Court of the United States of America. On a 5-4 decision, so very small majority, made a decision that has changed the definition of marriage. 
I do not invite you to be mean-spirited and angry about that. But it's because of that decision, a redefinition of marriage that goes against what Scripture says. And folks, we need to love people. But a part of loving people is being willing to say something is a sin. In fact, I dare warn you that to not tell somebody something is a sin and to allow them to be judged for that sin is the worst kind of hatred. It is not love. It is not grace. We are forced today to, to take a stand, if we choose to, that says whether we believe in biblical marriage or not. I, for one, believe that God ordained marriage from the beginning of time, even before sin, before the fall of man, that he created a man and a woman, uniquely designed them like my right and left hand. They are opposites. <laughs> what married couple here doesn't realize that? <laughs> okay. They are uniquely opposites and, and created to physically, emotionally, and spiritually to unite together. And that, as a church, we need to stand for that. Secondly, I am compelled to love the world, but to be willing to say that without Christ, without obedience to His Word, he warns you of your judgment. And if I love, I will say that. I take offense to those who raise their signs in front of a crowd of people they do not know and holler at them, you're going to hell! Repent! I take offense to that. And the reason I take offense to that is it may be true. And without Jesus Christ, it is true. And it should break our hearts because we love them. And we want no one. And this is what Christ said. We want no one to perish. Folks, if you care, get the plank out of your own eye so we can help a world that's going to go to hell without Jesus. Worship team, come, please. Jesus, every time we tell somebody not to judge, we've just judged them. Every time. The world even throws out that phrase, as we can see now. And God, I thank you. I thank you that I don't have that responsibility. I thank you that I don't have to determine people's motives. <laughs> Frankly, Lord, I thank you that I don't have to sit on many trials or any juries. But God, you and your infinite wisdom and your judgment do. I thank you that you do that with grace. Yet you also declare so forthrightly that there will be a day when there will be that dividing line and there will be those who will be judged who have chosen not to accept your kingdom, not to do your will, who have rejected you. And they will receive what they have chosen. And I thank you so much, Jesus. While evil bothers me, its influence in this world is increasing and that disturbs me. But I thank you, God, 
that you don't want anyone to perish and so you are patient and you are long-suffering and you hold back and you resist. Even though evil harms people, people are murdered, people are abused, people are sold into slavery, people are sexually assaulted, people are raped and tortured, people are have their heads cut off, and, and even though this is stuff that's done by evil, God, I thank you that you resist and hold back because you don't want anyone to perish. You love us. <coughs> Cleanse us, Jesus. Forgive us and help us to love in a world that has a hard time accepting you. In Jesus' name, amen.